I'm a fan of Gibson guitars, but even I haven't tried one of these. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglis Guitar Show. That's right, today we're finally reviewing one of Gibson's least loved designs, the non-reverse Firebird. Now that definitely comes down to opinion, but hear me out. I'm not talking about, hey, what about the Firebird X or the Dark Fire, or any of the robot guitars. I'm talking an actual body shape in Gibson's golden era that has seen widespread production over the years. So the Les Paul, the SG, the Reverse Firebird, the Explorer, Flying V, the Black Sheep, out of all of those, in my opinion, is the non-reverse Firebird. Bird. Mainly because the name is so confusing, but we'll talk about that here in a minute. But you guys know me, I wouldn't document one of these if it wasn't extra cool. Look at that. A viewer of the show sent me a link to this on Reverb and it's like, yep, I'm taking that puppy home because I've actually been wanting to document one of these for a while. They're a little bit of an enigma of why we have these swirl finishes, but I'm going to paint the story as best as I could find online. And if somebody else knows better, please feel free to chime in in the comments section because I feel this one needs a little bit of a community effort to figure out exactly what Gibson was doing here. But before we get into this, let's learn about the non-reverse Firebird. In 1963, Gibson comes out with the Firebird. Usually people just call them Firebirds, but the technical term is reverse Firebird. I believe the true reason comes down to the headstock that's reverse, and that's why they call the original Firebird the reverse model. However, since you've got the banjo tuners, you just don't realize that the tuners are on technically the opposite side of what you normally think for a six on a side headstock. But in 1965, the non-reverse Firebird comes out. Here's the two side by side. You can see the bodies are vaguely similar to reversing them. Obviously, they take some liberties. The new version is no longer a neck through construction, whereas the original Firebirds were. The pick guard has significantly changed as well. They're set neck, just like a regular Gibson guitar. And the original Firebirds don't usually look like this. This is a 2019 guitar. Originally, we would have had the banjo style tuners with the raised portion on the headstock, but the new one just looked like this. So on many modern day Firebirds, they just reverse it for these things. So they're not just one for one inverses of each other, but what we're talking about today is a custom shop version of the non-reverse Firebird. Now this is the part where I don't know for 100% sure when the custom shop first started producing these. A little bit of history, the regular Firebird took a short hiatus in the 80s, and throughout the 70s they were just kind of a weird mashup of the different models anyway, Firebird 1, 3, and 5. But in 1990 Gibson USA brings back the reverse Firebird. However, the custom shop as we think of it today as its own separate division opens in 1993, and they didn't start offering everything at once, it takes time. And from my research, it appears somewhere around the year 2000, Gibson started to toy around with the non-reverse Firebird. 7. That's the really upscale model. Typically you'll find them in like a TV white like finish. They've got the three mini humbuckers. Somewhere around 2002, I would assume to announce the launch of this new Firebird recreation in the custom shop in a non-7 format, more so like a 3 or a 5, they decided to do these weird out there finishes. Johnny A, a famous musician, was actually selling one of these back in late 2022 and I actually asked him about it because his was a cool green swirl and I love it because it looks like a watermelon. Who wouldn't want that? And he said he's the original owner and he got it at the NAMM show, so likely somewhere around 2002. You can also find a really cool copper swirl one. So far, that's the only three colors that I've seen show up online. It might be that these were just, you know, show off NAMM show pieces saying, hey, check out our new model. Or it could also be that uh, they actually had these things in production and they were willing to sell them, but they just didn't sell that well. I don't 100% know, but there are a handful of these things out there. So that's pretty much the best I can teach you history wise. Not many made, but you can't really call them a one off. But the initial run of these actually are pretty cool because we don't have the usual pickups in here. It's uncovered humbuckers. It still has a cover. They just chopped the top out of it. Wouldn't it have been cool had they'd used Les Paul Goddess series pickups in here? Now keep in mind that series hadn't came out yet, but to have the blue windings and then matching it for the other colors of the swirls, that'd be sweet. And look at this. We don't have a push-pull pot. They put one of them doofy vintage looking mini toggle switches on here. That is factory. I feel like I'm missing some of the fun having humbuckers, but at least it'll be 
familiar in that territory, but if the whole humbucker thing isn't to your taste, around 2006 they decided to make more of these, and they usually show up with mini humbuckers at that point. Or maybe they're traditional firebirds, I'm not sure, I haven't torn one apart. So what's my first impressions of like holding one of these in general? I mean, it's not as weird as I thought it was going to be. And dare I say, it actually kind of feels comfortable. It's a relatively flat body, but it's super wide. It kind of reminds me of the reverse flying V. Even though this looks super uncomfortable, I always like sitting and playing guitars like these because when they jut out against your chest like this, it helps vibrate against your body. And that can actually be a good thing because you've got a little bit of a cutaway right here. So it rests right up against your body. It is kind of strange how chunky the neck looks at this angle. Let's face it, it actually has a pretty decently chunky neck profile, but not over bearing by any means. And the design is fairly decent for getting all the frets. But I'm really digging these metal knobs. That works great with this pick guard and finish style. I just love that we have the matching headstock. And Jazzmasters are known for their anodized metal pick guards, so seeing that on basically Gibson's equivalent of that's kind of cool. I will say this looks way cooler in person than it does in photos, because in the flesh, it's this kind of greeny bubbly areas that really stand out to you more so than the dark and light blues. And seeing it run all the way up the edge of the fretboard's a real special treat. I like that. And of course the backside of our headstock too. But what kind of case candy do we have? Surprisingly, still have the large paper COA. Usually people lose these, but this is kind of a giant case, so it actually has a compartment that it'll fit in, so no wonder it's still here. But look at that! Like some sort of a professional photo shoot? Anybody recognize that background? Was it at the NAMM show or something? Or is this just something someone had printed? Could be anything, but I would guess something somebody had printed. And how cool is this? The original receipt from 2002 from a Russo Music Center. It looks like it was just shy of 1700. Looks like the MSRP, the made up price back then was 3300. And then the actual shop had it tagged at 23. And then he got it for that deal. But it still has all the other original paperwork Mr. Dealer card that you would find in this era, as well as our warranty card, filled out as a non-reverse Firebird custom, likely for the finish. Silica packet. But the reverb seller said this thing was mint stored in the case, and yep, that's exactly what those frets say. That's gonna need some help. So let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. Got the case crust off, it's looking good now. It's starting to remind me more so of like a nice blue saltwater taffy because it's like a blue and silver mix on this. The aluminum pickguard works really well with this blue swirl finish. I was kind of scared if it was going to polish up or not because it definitely had some like finger gunk dried on it, but now it's nice and shiny again. But we've got our Firebird emblem over here with our toggle switch over here. And here's a look at the top side of those pickups again. We've got the cover on the side, just not the top. So let's go ahead and pop the hood, see what's under. Looks like this one's routed specifically for two humbuckers, so if you want a third pickup or anything else, you would have to do additional routing. And here's what the toggle switch routes look like. If you wanted to put mini toggles or something in there, you've got the room. There's how the neck is set into the body. Kind of interesting. Reminds me of bolt-on neck designs. These humbuckers have the gray wirings coming out of them. That's because they're for conductor, which is how we can pull off having that coil split. I would imagine at one point in time these had the patent applied for decals, but they've just worn off or they wore off at the factory at installation. But thankfully we have these stickers, so we know it's a burst bucker two and a burst bucker three. Although I don't think I've seen the NE wound by sign off before. Backside of that pickguard, it's definitely an aluminum material. The whole first 10 years of the custom shop was really rather experimental. They knew they wanted to create like the historic reissues, but they didn't know exactly what else they could do with the custom shop. So towards the late 90s, they started to toy around with like these really cool custom finishes, especially in the early 2000s. You also see like the sparkly colors. Another series kind of similar to this would be like my Silver Flow Les Paul Elegant that we talked about in this episode. It was the birth of the custom shop as we know it today. And it took them a while to, you know, bring out all the different models and their historic reissues and the more fun versions that they could create. And that's kind of what I classify this one as, is a fun one because we don't have the traditional pickups in here at all. And everything else has been changed too. 
But our readings within the circuit, 8.4k ohms in the bridge, 8.6ish in the neck, and the middle just for fun, 4.34. So that means the down position will be our full humbucker tones, but we can coil split by pulling it up there to get 4.5 in the bridge, about 5 in the neck, and 2.55 in the middle. I think I might need to clean out the wirings because these keep moving. But what's strange is that's a little bit less than half. I wonder if that one is wired more like a coil tap, removing some of the windings within the coils, rather than the full just running half. I guess we'll have to plug in and find out. And then I've never had one of these before, so I never really even thought about how is it laid out. Two volumes and two tones. So it's neck volume, neck tone, bridge volume, bridge tone. You'd think it'd make more sense to lay it out like the Les Paul, but like reversed and then have a toggle switch, but they had to fit your output jack on the front for this model. It is how history made it, but you do have a little notch right here so you know where you kind of are anyways. Then they use a set screw to put that onto the pot. Now let's check out the bridge and tailpiece. It's a Gibson ABR1 with wire retainer, and it is mounted historically. And then we have a full weight tailpiece. So I think the reason why this guitar feels so tiny is it's about the same width as the wings of a regular Firebird, but you don't have that raised portion, so it's just a slab. But you still have like the comfort cuts on the back, so it feels ultra thin in certain areas too. I mean, the chunkiest this is is about 1.3 inches. But yet it's rather wide at about 12 inches and nearly 13 on the lower bout. And from right about where the neck joins to the body, it's about 20 inches. Just to put you in the mindset of the general guidelines, because remember, the neck is joining like right here, so it actually seems like you got another couple inches there. So that also makes it seem like a rather obnoxiously long Gumby guitar. <laughs> a straight up green one of these would be pretty sweet. Moving on from our mahogany body, we've got the mahogany neck with our rosewood fretboard. Check those frets out now. It's a little bit of a labor of love. When they're that oxidized, if you're following my cleaning guide, you want to take the steel wool first and then do the whole Dremel polishing and then you get these results. Otherwise, you might have to do the Dremel polish a couple of times. But no fancy inlays on these, just regular perloid dots. Let's say the cool side marker inlays with the matching of the finish definitely makes up for it. However, I wonder if the reason why they didn't do so many of these comes down to maintenance issues. The ends of the frets almost have like a fret nib created by the paint. So to refret one of these, I don't know, you might mess up the finish along the side of the fretboard because a lot of unbound models don't actually get the paint going all the way up there. But in my opinion, it's one of the coolest features of this guitar. Same thing's true on the nut. Not only on the sides of the nut, but also on the top of it. So if you ever have to work on that on this guitar, unfortunately, you'll probably lose that paint or at least the clean line. And it could splinter the rest of the finish too, if you're not careful. But I measure a 1.71 inch nut width, increasing to 2.05. First fret necked up, 0.87, and a chunky 0.98 by the 12th. Here's a look at that neck profile, first fret and 12th fret. It is a rounded C-shaped neck profile. Never been a fan of the non-reverse headstock style. Something about it, it just doesn't look good on other models. But on the guitar, it's meant to be on. It kind of works. But here's a look at our truss rod. Got painted over, but it still works. And you have the same matching aluminum truss rod cover, which is looking good and six on a line Grover tuners. Moving on to the backside. So here's where you can kind of make out the familiar Firebird shape, but even then, they're not one for one, just flips of each other. They did make some vague changes besides just that. They squared this up a little bit more and then they rounded off the edges just a tad. But we can take a second to appreciate our cool blue swirl finish. You might think it looks like a bowling ball as well. Just depends what you've seen in your life, what you'll see in this. Could just be, you know, bubbly ocean type thing. But I think having this guitar in a taffy pulling shop would be a lot of fun. Maybe if my museum has a, a candy counter, I'll put it there. <laughs> but we've just got our regular Gibson branded pots. Nothing too crazy in here until you get to that. And having a mini toggle switch. I mean, that's really uncommon in this era for them to still be using mini toggles. But kind of a cool vintage throwback. As far as our strap buttons, one at the bottom and then one at the top horn right there. Now we'll take a look around the edges. For me personally, I love the edges the most because it has like interesting swirl patterns and some spots didn't get swirled all that much. This one has like an eye formation and there's a lot of silver on the neck over here. Got a little happy face right there. 
And you've got a lot of green coming through over here. But right here didn't get much of a swirl. It's just straight through to the silver like I was saying. It's kind of cool. And then where the neck joins the body, you can see a small faint line. That's common with a nitro finish. Nothing to be alarmed about. But look at that. Nice and rounded over. The heel joining onto the body is a fairly smooth transition. Now we'll take a look along the other side of the neck where you don't have the side markers. It helps you see how the finish runs up along the frets a little bit more. And all our blue directly on the back. Gibson Custom Shop logo, serial CS21473. So how do we know it's in the 2000s? You've got five digits. And then your first digit tells you the year, 2002. And we've got our Grover tuners. Now let's get that weight. Hey, that's not too bad. Eight pounds, 2.8 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how a hot-rotted non-reverse bird sounds. Right, first thing, the middle is wired at a phase factory. <laughs> Whether that was a mistake or not, I guess we'll have to document more of these to find out. But these pickups are ridiculously aggressive. That's the clean channel, by the way. I do not have a drive on or anything like that. But if you roll the volumes off on each of them to you know, roughly seven, let's see what we get there. Sounds like I'm rolling the tones down at the same time. if I'm wrong, but I think the treble bleed mod would help with that. Well, that was full humbucking mode. Now let's switch into the single coil. We're all on tens, by the way. Definitely has a nice punchy spankiness to it. Very P90-like territory. And you'll notice that the middle position is no longer out of phase.
I think you get the idea of how it sounds. I'm not going to say it's my favorite tones in the world, but there's some interesting tones. I personally really like it when they're split and kind of have that P90-like tone. As far as, you know, neck dive test, it just wants to sit horizontal, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But if you've ever thought an SG has a long neck, my goodness, try playing one of these things. Because the headstock adds to the illusion. This, it just basically feels like you're playing a giant neck. And for me, there's a bit of a playing disconnect as far as like going for the super soloing registers. Because once the body starts, you can just visibly see it gets so much chunkier. My brain says, okay, you need to stop at about the 12th fret so you don't run into that area. It's not my favorite Gibson. It never will be. But if you like Jazz Masters and want to try a Gibson out, I mean, you might try this because it just dawned on me. Look at this headstock. Look familiar to a Fender by chance? But while playing in this thing, something dawned on me. I think these models might have influenced a very infamous Gibson iteration, the Firebird X. They came in the red swirl and the blue swirl paint jobs. It's loosely based on the non-reverse Firebird shape. You can see it's actually a lot chunkier and I actually prefer it. Despite the not so much love for this guitar, it really is a good playing piece. But all right, Droglodytes, I hope you enjoyed this fun little episode. I'm glad I found one of these. If you happen to be selling the green or the other one for a fair price, let me know. Wouldn't mind having a set of them because we need some non-reverse ones in the collection. That and every non-guitar player that I show this to, they're like, oh, I love that finish. So it's perfect for the collection of the museum. All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.